Okay, good morning. This is Richard Shu. I'm Sherman Sterling. I'm the head of our co-chair of our privacy and data protection practice. Uh, today, I'm very pleased to have as my guest, Jim Adler, who's head of data at Toyota Research Institute. Jim, welcome. Oh, thanks for having me, Richard. So, Jim, let's start by, I know you're brand new to Toyota. Why don't you tell me a little bit about what you're working on in Toyota and specifically what you're working on with respect to privacy? Sure. So I'm, uh, as you said, running the, the, da the data efforts at Toyota Research Institute, and we're focused on self-driving cars and home robots, and those, uh, those products are dependent on tons of data. Uh, in order to be trained and operate effectively uh, and delight customers and, and perform some real valuable features and, and, uh, and services. And so data is integral to those efforts. And uh, with data comes a bunch of technology requirements and challenges, but also a bunch of privacy and data governance challenges as well. So I have a foot in the technology camp. I'm an engineer by training but I also have a love of policy and uh, how data is handled responsibly. Mm. Well, that seems like a lot to be responsible for. You mentioned a lot of different technologies. Yeah. Let's just focus on the connected cars, because that's sure. obviously very big. Uh, there was that Tesla thing that's kind of in the news. Mm. Specifically with respect to connected cars, tell me what are some of the, let's talk about what are the new issues or the privacy issues that are raised by having a new technology than before. Well, I think the, uh, the interesting thing about connected cars is uh, your cars are getting smarter. Uh, they're connected into your life. Uh, that your car is becoming more and more like your phone. And so with that comes a lot of interesting uh, issues around uh, a customer's expectation of privacy, what will, what will happen to their data, uh, will it be used for certain regula regulated uses like insurance. Uh, so as the automobile, it's funny, the automobile has been integrated into our lives for more than 100 years, uh, but now it's really getting integrated <laughs> to our lives. Uh, and so with that uh, comes a, a tremendous amount of responsibility uh, and the opportunity to really project our values uh, onto uh, this device that actually has its own room in our home. It has a garage. It's actually part of the family. Mm. And and it's, it's going to... Uh, uh, be more and more integrated, and with that comes uh, uh, a level of responsibility that uh, you need to take really seriously, and it crosses over from the technology world into the policy world, into the business world, and those three communities, I think, are getting pushed together uh, in what I've called big wisdom, which is this idea that uh, our our wisdom should track the pace of our technology, hmm. which it really has not to date. And I think if we're going to really realize what's the best uh, of this technology, it's going to have to be informed by uh, good uh, policymakers. And when I say policymakers, I kind of mean more broadly uh, historians and journalists and economists and philosophers, uh, as well as policymakers and, and, and regulators. Uh, but also the other communities of technologists and, and, and business people. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me some of the specific things on which how the, some of this personal data is going to be used or could be used with connected cars. Yeah, well, I think that the first, uh, the, the first uh, opportunity is how do you get these cars to operate effectively? Uh, and how do you make sure they, they, they drive responsibly? And I don't mean uh, – Going at certain speeds. Going at certain speed or following the rules, but uh, how do they blend in? Uh, uh, driving policy is, is actually tough. If you drive uh, uh, in, in New York as though you were in Kansas, mm. uh, you'll stick out. <laughs> uh, and, and you may cause some accidents because you're too conservative. Mm. New York drivers are quite aggressive. Uh, and so if you're going to have a self-driving car, how should it drive uh, so that it mm -hmm. drives like the median cars within a locale? It's a pretty tough problem. Hmm. Uh, how will a car, uh, assuming that all the cars won't be self-driving cars anytime soon, how does a self-driving car recognize uh, the other cars on the road and, and how aggressive those other cars might be? Hmm. There's a great George Carlin uh, uh, line that says, you know, everyone on the road, everyone who, dri who drives faster than you is a maniac and everyone who's driving slower than you is an idiot. And so the car has to have a classifier 
uh, of maniacs and idiots. Mm. <laughs> mm. Right? And so is someone really aggressive and mm. maybe I shouldn't merge in uh, to that person because they'll close the gap and not let me get in or this, this driver is, is respectful and will let me get in. Mm. Uh, and that's a, 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 tough, uh, a, a tough machine learning problem actually. Mm. And so data will inform all of these uh, kinds, of, kinds of driving policies. Hmm. And that's just the beginning. I mean, yeah, right. how, you know, how do you get good maps and how do you really understand uh, uh, the sensors that are, uh, that, that are becoming more and more installed uh, in greater numbers hmm. on these cars? Hmm. Well, and also, like, just to your point earlier, like, you might want to drive a style that also fits your personality, right? Like some people like to drive more aggressively mm -hmm. and some people don't, right? That's I mean, right. so I'm assuming that also needs to play that's into right. it as well. And, and, and I think it, one of the things that, that we're doing at, at Toyota is – uh, we have a, a, a project working on, on chauffeur, which is completely autonomous driving. And we also have uh, an effort uh, around uh, a guardian angel, we call it, you know, uh, which is helping you stay safer. Hmm. And so I like to drive. I don't want to give up driving completely. Right. I, just wanna, I just want my driving to be safer. Mm -hmm. And so I want my, uh, my car to be smarter about what's around me and help me see in those blind spots not let me make lane changes that I shouldn't make. Mm. Uh, make sure that it uh, it helps me if I'm if my attention is diverted. Uh, these sorts of things. So, really understanding how uh, the automobile can can be a better companion mm -hmm. uh, while I'm on the road, mm. Uh, mm. a better co-pilot mm. is also. Uh, a, a big challenge and a huge opportunity. Now, you mentioned some of the other uh, uses of personal data. You said insurance might be able to be helped. What are some of the other things that, that are being contemplated uh, or talked about as far as using information well, for a car? Certainly, there's a, whole bunch of, there's a whole bunch of business model innovation going on. There's a bunch of startups here in the Valley that are doing a lot of interesting things. Uh, uh, a lot of it is uh, most of the, the – insurance is a great example because uh, actuaries have – uh, taken a a premium uh, setting premiums relative to risk uh, that's been sort of average within an area and average within driving behavior, and now there's they're going to have fine grain data uh, around uh, driving habits and uh, how your premiums might be set relative to driving behavior. Uh, that's kind of a scary thing in some sense, uh, <laughs> and and it's important that. Drivers have full transparency. Uh, if, if the the sense is that most people should save money uh, because there's the there's mm. more opportunity to reward good driving mm -hmm. and encourage good driving. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I would like or safe to, driving. Safe driving. Yeah. I mean, I have two grown sons, and I would like them to have more transparency around their driving habits and how it affects uh, their premiums. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that if you have transparency, that provides enough uh, uh, user expectation of matching with the user's expectation of privacy and the ability to rescind consent and uh, down the road. So you really become a partner with, uh, with these kinds of business models where it's just not an 80-page uh, notice that you need to consent to once and you can never look back. Mm -hmm. I think there's going to be much more flexible uh, – notice and consent and transparency uh, uh, technologies that are going to be coming. Well, I was just going to ask about that because that's the other thing I was going to ask you. I mean, now you're driving. Can you really interact with the user with notice and consent, or do you think another model is going to come up to be able to deal with, you know, the fact that, for example, you're driving and they, if you want to, you know, use a service, now they're going to ask you, is that is that going to be practical? or? Well, I, I think while you're driving, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, but uh, during a day's trip, you could you could review what what happened during that day. Uh, once a month, you can look at your driving history and and what might have impacted uh, your rates for that month. Uh, so I think there'll be I, I do think there'll be innovation around uh, uh, human factors and 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 giving the driver enough insight into what's happening without overwhelming them with information. I think that's a delicate balance. Mm. And that's why I think you have to have the technology folks with uh, the, the policy wonks and, you know, uh, to really 
get this right. Hmm. Let's talk about the technology a little bit. I know you're a technologist by background. Tell me a little bit, is, is the technology really there or, I mean, is that, or what's the rate determining step to use another science term in terms of, you know, the self-driving cars? Is it more making, making sure the policies are working out or does the technology still have some ways to go? I think the technology has some ways to go. Uh, I think when you look at uh, being able to drive in all conditions, uh, in all places in the world, mm. being able to do it everywhere, mm. uh, that's a hard problem. Mm -hmm. uh, tough weather, uh, dangerous road conditions, uh, road conditions that have changed, uh, are changing rapidly, construction zones. There's a lot of variability uh, in, in a driving scenario uh, that we have to anticipate. And, and, and any self-driving car will have to anticipate that. So... Sure, on a sunny day uh, with well-understood roads and great uh, sensors, yeah, you can get it. The technology is, is there. But can it really do uh, what we expect? I mean, humans are very good drivers, mm -hmm. uh, and machines have to meet that standard. Is there any question that we'll have these self-driving cars in your lifetime, in my lifetime? What do you think? Well, I mean, we – the. We have them now. Uh, Tesla is beta testing yeah. uh, autopilot. Uh, and so uh, there's movement in that direction. Uh, and so I think definitely within our lifetime. Right, right. Uh, and, and the question is, what does the, the car driving public want? Do they want – they still want to drive? Uh, my, an my, my answer to that is, is probably yes for, for large swaths of the driving public. They certainly want to be safer, mm -hmm. and so I think you're going to see more assistive technologies. Uh, there's certain segments that are going to be completely self-driving, uh, maybe uh, and, and likely in commercial applications. Mm. Uh, so ride sharing and fleets and, and uh, uh, trucking, perhaps, you'll see more and more self-driving mm -hmm. in those applications. So it may not be one-size-fits-all. It may be different technologies inserted to different markets based on those needs. Mm. Tell me a little bit about the problem that I hear a lot about, lawyers talk a lot about, is the liability problem. When you, when you have two auto self-driving cars crash, you know, whose fault is it being? How are you going to figure out whose fault it is? What, what are your thoughts on that, or what, what, do you, what do you think about that problem? Well, I, yeah, I think it comes down to, to the, insurance, the, the insurance question. And this actually gets to a, a, a big philosophical question uh, of uh, if, if, it's a, if it's an accident uh, uh, that causes the crash, uh, then you can look at, say, you know, who, uh, which algorithm made the mistake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you could, you, so there, there could, you could look at it that way. Right. Uh, I think the, and that, w those issues will be brought to the fore over the next few years. Yeah. I think the more interesting question uh, is, what if a car has perfect knowledge of what's going on around it? Right. And it has to make a very tough decision. Uh, some something has to get hit, yeah, and it's got to make a decision. Yeah, uh, that's a that's a uh, a question of wisdom. What which right. choice do you make? I mean, we as humans may not have the reaction time to, to even make, make that decision, decision, right? Yeah, but right. a machine may. And so, should it sac should it sacrifice the driver? Or should sacrifice uh, should swerve and sacrifice? some other uh, uh, vehicle. Mm -hmm. That's or a person, human, right? Or a person. Yeah. And, and so uh, I think those questions need to be uh, discussed and debated. Uh, it, it reminds me of, you know, all, all great wisdom comes from Star Trek, especially as a geek uh, <laughs> like me, uh, that uh, 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 the good of the many outweigh the, the, the good of the few or the one. Right, uh, right. And so I think those sorts of... of, of uh, bits of wisdom may uh, be projected into situations mm. like these in the coming years. Is that something that's being debated right now, or is, are people just kind of holding off on uh, that until we sort of get to that point? I think they need to be debated now. Yeah, I, yeah. I really do. I, I think that if you look at uh, the policy landscape, uh, there's always, and I've talked about this, there's, there, there's three camps. There's geek suits and wonks, and, and the geeks are usually the most optimistic because we're the ones who can dream up this technology and we could code it up and we can make it happen and we're very excited about it and we're breathless about it. And then the business people come in and say, wow, we can make money from this. This is great. <laughs> uh, and then the wonks are usually there to clean out the messes and they're the most pessimistic. Mm. Uh, and it's sort of serialized, right? It's, you know, it's, it's the, the geeks dream it, 
the business people make it happen, the, the suits make it happen, and then the wonks need to clean it up, clean up the messes. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if we continue to have that kind of serial uh, disposition of these technologies, I think we'll constantly be wringing our hands. Mm. I think we need to bring these communities together into the, you know, this, the, this paradigm mm. that has these communities working together for the long term. Uh, I think that's the only way that we're going to sort of operationalize privacy or operationalize ethics mm. so that we have these debates now. Why shouldn't we have these debates now? We know they're coming. I mean, this is not something that uh, is going to surprise us. We, we know self-driving cars are coming. Uh, we know these technologies are right around the corner. We should have these debates now. So tell me a little bit about, since you're on all ends of it, you're on the technology side, you're also on the policy side, where are you, I mean, where are you on the optimism scale? In other words, are you on the optimistic scale where you see all this possibility or do you see all the problems and think, oh my God, this will never happen? Like, where are you on that optimism scale? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, you know, uh, uh, clinical, clinical optimist. Yeah. Uh, and, and, but yet I'm, I'm often... Uh, embedded with pessimists mm -hmm. uh, and for good reason. I think it's, I think I often, and I've learned this over the years that sometimes you learn the best things from your toughest critics. So in all the stuff that you have to deal with, which sounds like a lot, I mean, what do you think is sort of the thorniest issue that you have to wrestle with or is it all, you know, you think it's all pretty manageable and what, what are your thoughts uh, on that? I'm not that naive to think it's all <laughs> manageable. Uh, I, I, I think most of it is uh, is around uh, you know human machine interaction and, and uh, human factors and, and sensitizing people to what's important uh, without overwhelming them with what is not important. Mm. Uh, we need to be better integrated with with technology, uh, and I think too often it's it's always make it simpler, make it simpler, make it simpler. Well, you want to make it as simple as possible, but not simpler than possible, mm. as, as someone uh, uh, named Einstein taught us. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes I think we, we aim to make things simpler than possible. Right. And so how do you get that right? Uh, because there's all kinds of folks out there with uh, different tolerances and uh, for uh, difficulty and uh, their early adopters that love geeky stuff, but then, you know, how does it pass the mom test? Uh, can your mom operate this thing? And, and can she get sensitized to the issues that are really important uh, and dispense with the issues that are not? And how do you do this in a situational way uh, so you have sort of just-in-time transparency without distracting the driver, right, to, to, right. to use your example? So that's where I think much of the challenges mm. are. Mm. Uh, and I think the other big challenge is, is, is changing the, this, uh, this paradigm around serialized scrutiny and innovation. It, it's, not the t it's not to the geeks, then to the suits, then to the wonks. I think it's in parallel. How do we have this conversation together? And how do we ha find a common vocabulary to debate it and discuss it and not demonize each other and, and realize that we all bring something vitally important to the table here? Uh, and how do we not just simplify it uh, beyond recognition mm. uh, and have the substantive discussions? I think those two areas, uh, sort of community debate and then ha reaching down uh, uh, to the product itself and how does it interact with, with the user driver uh, are, I think, the two most important areas. Does this job feel like the greatest challenge you've ever faced or does it feel overwhelming? Oh, it's definitely the greatest. <laughs> I was so excited to get to, to get to land this gig. Uh, it, it's amazingly uh, exciting. Interesting. Uh, I mean, how often do you get the opportunity to uh, to work on the data that is feeding uh, uh, into the, the the technologies that are uh, going to be integrated in our lives for yeah, generations? Yeah, and yeah. and the the cars are the most near term uh, opportunity, but I think. A car, a self-driving car, is really just a robot, right? Right. Uh, right. And uh, it maybe doesn't have legs, but it it it's it's trained. It's uh, it, it's given situational awareness. It has to decide what to do in those situations. Uh, the manipulators are relatively simple. It's the brake, the gas, and the and the steering wheel. Uh, but uh, it ha it shares a lot of uh, a lot of the commonalities with with robots, mm -hmm. and and I think that's why. Uh, Toyota is kind of interested in this because they feel that 
the safety implications and uh, the uh, the consumer uh, opportunities and the ability to to really change people's lives are, are really quite profound, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's great to be part of it. Now you mentioned you had just you've only been there I think a, f a pretty short yeah, amount of time, yeah, like a month. month or so. Do you feel like you're just still on the steep part of the learning curve, or do you actually feel like you're kind of getting your arms around things? I think on the data side, I'm I I have a lot to bring. I think on the uh, we have some of the best researchers uh, and and product people on the planet uh, on on cars and robots. So on that, I'm on a very steep learning curve on cars and robots. <laughs> uh, the good news is that they throw off tons and tons of data, and that's something that I have quite a bit of experience dealing with tons and tons of data, and data is data. Uh, if you d I did a calculation over the last week or so. They said, well, how much data are we dealing with here? And if uh, Toyota sells about 10 million cars every year, uh, and uh, if you just look at how, if given the kind of sensors that self-driving cars require, uh, that fleet of cars every year will throw off about 1,000 exabytes of data, a million petabytes of data. Wow. Uh, every year. Uh, new data every year. Wow. Yeah. It's like astounding. Uh, and so, uh, and that data will, you know, will be used for all kinds of purposes and uh, to make the, of course, make the, the, the car smarter uh, and, uh, and, you know, inform how they deal with all kinds of situations. Uh, but also there's in, in, incredible challenges around privacy and governance hmm. and compliance, hmm. uh, which in earlier life in, in, in the background check world, the public records world taught me that if you have good governance on the data itself, everything else is so much better. Hmm. Because with that much data, uh, if noise creeps in, it cascades, and then you have a thousand exabytes of, of junk hmm. that you don't know, you, you can't make heads or tails of, and you certainly can't stand the scrutiny of, of disputes and, and, and uh, contention around what does this data mean. Right. You have to be really meticulous down to the record and field level of where, the, where has this data been, who's touched it, uh, what, el well, what else has it been combined with, and you need to have a provenance of this data to make sense of it. Mm. And that's a really exciting mm. possibility uh, uh, and, and great opportunity to what, work around. Let's talk a little bit about the other side of privacy, which is very important, obviously security. What kind of security issues are being raised by connected cars? Is that going to make it, is that going to be a, a, a more difficult security issue? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think, I think security is always top of mind. Uh, often even uh, uh, superseding the privacy uh, issues. Uh, uh, if you can't secure the device, uh, you can't really use it. And if you can't use it, the privacy uh, challenges don't really uh, rise to the top. Right. So right. security always precedes privacy, which is why security is at least a decade ahead of privacy. Mm. Uh, and so the, the security uh, requirements are always top of mind. Uh, is it more acute in, in connected cars than other other arenas, or it's just the same security uh, problem? I think that uh, as technology moves into the automobile, there's it's the security concerns are going to be greater and greater. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I mean, traditionally, cars have been they've had I mean, no computers, they haven't been connected to a network, they've been rel relatively isolated, and then rel therefore relatively secure. Right. As soon as you connect them and give them uh, computational capability, give them a brain, uh, and you connect them to something, they become at risk. And that's going to be difficult. Uh, the good news is you have a, a, a mature industry that is very meticulous in, uh, in because they're so safety conscious. Uh, that's in the DNA. And security and safety are, are joined at the hip. And so I think, I think that we need a good dose of pessimism mm -hmm. to balance our optimism with connected cars mm -hmm. uh, and listen to the folks that have been keeping us safe in automobiles for years uh, and, and not try to go faster than possible on the tech. Uh, and so, and I, and I do feel that, that and there, always is, there, there will always be incidences of, of hacking. Uh, luckily, we have some really good white hat hackers out there that are <laughs> sharing uh, their <laughs> exploits uh, 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 with us. Uh, and I think we need to encourage those efforts for sure, uh, because that's the only way that that uh, that we get visibility into into these issues. Uh, 
years ago, I ran an online voting company, founded an online voting company, and uh, we were all about, and I think the crypto world, this is about cryptographic protocols for, uh, for governmental, vo governmental voting, and you have to be open with the technology, you have to be open with the crypto uh, in order to uh, f let people find problems with it. Uh, if you, if you, oh, it, the secret should only be in the keys. Everything else should be open. Uh, and that way, you, good people will find your problems for you. Yeah. And we need to encourage that kind of behavior. Uh, it's often uh, at odds with business folks. They say, I don't want to open my stuff because it, the, the imp the, your gut tells you that it should be more secure if you keep it uh, secret under wraps. But actually, that's not true. That just keeps the the flaws hidden too. Hmm. If you open it up, uh, really smart people will find th your flaws for you and share those flaws. Um, and I think the security community, I pretty much have made that message quite clear. Hmm. Uh, and I think the the connected car, self driving car industry. Uh, would be well served to, to heed those lessons. Well, Jim, it's been a fascinating conversation. In five years, I can't wait for you to come back and tell me how things are progressing. Well, thanks, Richard. It's been a pleasure to be here. This is Richard Chu and Jim Adler. Thanks.